Welcome. I have no idea what's going on, guys. This this could be a major fiasco. To Lighting for Profits, your number one source for all things landscape lighting. Powered by Emery Allen. From lighting design, install, sales, and marketing. And I'm just like, okay, is this where I get beat up in front of my friends? Like, what's going to happen? We discuss everything you need to know to start and grow a successful landscape lighting business. That's what I like. Now, here is your host, Ryan Lee. What is up? What is up? Welcome to the number one landscape lighting show in the world. It's Lighting for Profits, powered by Emery Allen. Guys, we got a great show lined up today, and I'm really, really excited. But you know what? I started to get a little bit, a little bit tired about an hour ago, and I thought, you know what? What better way to give me some energy than to get some Mountain Dew in me? So I got my new landscape lighting secret koozies. Decided to throw a Mountain Dew in there. So cheers to you. And uh, thanks for being here live if you are. If you're listening to the podcast, that's fine, too. I still love you. still appreciate you. Ah, Time to get some energy, get some of that Mountain Dew caffeine in you. I do not recommend it. It's probably bad for your health, teeth, and everything else, but uh, that's just the way I roll around here. So uh, excited to uh, be with you guys here today. Thanks for uh, being part of the show. Thanks for your support. Um, I do got to beg you a little bit, but if you have not subscribed, go subscribe to uh, wherever you listen to, to the podcast, some people don't subscribe and that's great, but go, just go hit the button. It does help me out. It helps me get the word out. Uh, so whether it's YouTube or whether you're going to listen to it on Spotify or Apple, wherever it is, just, just subscribe, help me out, help a brother out. What's up, Bobby. Good to see you, man. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Bobby Walker. If you guys haven't listened to his podcast, go ahead, put a link there, Bobby. I don't care. Do it. Trying to help you out, trying to help everybody out. Um, so uh, today, guys, today I'm super excited. We've got uh, Roger Ramsey. Roger Ramsey, he'll be joining us in just a few minutes. He is the National Category Manager for Outdoor Living with uh, Ewing Irrigation. And uh, I've got a, um, I, you know, Ewing Irrigation was one of those distributors that really helped me out when I was getting started. And so I'm excited to have Roger on so we can talk about uh, his role in the in the company and really what uh, what their company does and how they add value to the industry. So super excited to have him on. And uh, if you guys are looking to start or grow a landscape lighting business, then this is it. You're definitely in the right place. So uh, glad you are here. And we are always here to help educate and motivate to help you dominate. Uh, so um, just do me a favor, go and subscribe. And uh, as always, well, not always, but we did start a new segment a while ago. We're doing it. We're doing it this week gift card giveaway. That's right. We're going to do gift card giveaway. And uh, I'm, that's basically my attempt to pay you for listening to the show. So if you're here live, make sure to stick around because you're going to actually get an opportunity to win free money just for answering the question correctly first. And it's not that difficult of a question, but uh, uh, yeah. What's up, Angel? Thanks for being here. Definitely a good lineup today. Uh, so yeah, stick around for the gift card giveaway. Um, before we have uh, Roger on, again, we're going to have Roger Ramsey, National Category Manager for Outdoor Living at Ewing Irrigation. Um, I want to uh, I want to thank uh, Emery Allen for their uh, their partnership. Um, you know, nothing hurts a quality landscape lighting install quite like flickering bulbs, a yellow fringe around the perimeter of the beam spread, or bulbs that burn out after a few on and off cycles. So don't jeopardize your customer's experience by using a budget bulb, okay? If you want to go out of your way to provide a world-class customer experience, choose Emory Allen. At the end of the day, it's what's on the inside that counts. So take advantage of Emory Allen's world-class customer service and get 10% off your first order for new customers. And all you have to do is email the owner. I don't know why Tom's still the owner and the salesperson. I'm trying to convince him to just, you know, replace himself, but not everyone listens to me. What am I going to do? But right now, you get you get to be lucky because you get to deal with him directly. Just email him, tomg at emeryallen.com. Get your account set up. Uh, he'll get your discounted contractor pricing, which is way better than if you go onto their website. Just mention that you heard about him right here on Lighting for Profits, and you'll, you'll get those uh, that discounted contractor pricing. Just email tomg at emeryallen.com and get your account set up today. All right. 
So before we have uh, Roger join us, uh, I was talking to him uh, uh, just a few minutes ago before we started the show. He is backstage, if there is such a thing. It's just digital. He's probably just at his house or something, but I'm going to say backstage because it sounds better. Um, or he's probably out in the field because this guy, man, I'm telling you, everywhere I go, I look up and there's Roger. Like, it doesn't matter what trade show you go to. It doesn't matter any type of training. Like, what? Like, does this guy, like, time travel? He's everywhere. He, like, knows everything. He's he's He, he might know more than Google. Like, he, he just knows all this stuff. And it's because he's constantly learning. He's constantly bettering himself and going to these trade shows and stuff like that. So you, if you, if you have not met him, stick around. You're going to want to connect with him. You're going to want to find out who he is. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge and just a fantastic resource uh, and just a good person to know. So, uh, but before we have Roger join us, um, I want to share something with you. Do you guys ever feel like you're just not doing things correctly? <laughs> like, like everything you try just seems to not go the way that you planned it in your head, uh, or at least not exactly as it goes, as it should go in your mind. Are you with me? It sucks, right? You have this idea, you know, it's going to work exactly how you've got it thought out. You even ask people for their feedback and they tell you it's good. Um, you even see others succeeding at a very similar process and you're like, well, if they can do it. I can do it. In fact, I can do it better than them, right? Yes. Are you with me? So then you go do the thing, whatever the thing is, growing your business. Um, and then it doesn't work out like you planned. And you're about ready to admit defeat. <laughs> and you understand finally the definition of humility. It is like humility at its finest. If you have been in that situation, and maybe you're in that situation right now, or you're just like, dude, I've tried to raise my price. I've tried to close more deals. I've tried tried to hire more people. It seems like no one can solve that, right? I've tried to get more leads. I try to have more free time, but I keep getting pulled back into my business. Whatever it is, if it feels really hard and is really painful, then yes, I'm talking to you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, okay? If you are feeling that pain, you are on the right track, my friend. You are on to something. You are on to something big. You've got this, okay? Pain, I did not... I've heard this. I don't even know who said this. I should have looked it up. But pain is weakness leaving the body, right? And it means you're growing. You see, most of us don't remember growing as like a kid, right? But think back. And I did this actually today. I thought back. And for me, it was like 30 years ago. And do you remember your legs hurting? Do you remember actually having growing pains? Do you remember? Like, it was painful. And there, there was like nothing you could do. It's just like I didn't do anything. It's just my bones are hurting right? Because they're growing and it sucked, right? Kind of like what you're going through right now, but look at the result. Would you have rathered not do any, not endure any pain and stay three feet tall, right? Or four feet tall, however tall you were at the time. Some of, our, some of you are like, yeah, I actually would have, right? If I could go back to that time, whatever, but that's not what happened. Okay, you, you went through those growing pains and now you are who you are. So now you're six feet tall or maybe some of you are only five feet five and some of you are only five feet tall. I'm sorry. There's, there's just It is what it is. Um, but I came to be six foot one, right? And you are whatever height you are now, but you're that height forever. Like you already, you put in the time, you put in the pain and now it's just done, right? Well, I, I guess until you like start getting older and then you start shrinking, right? But uh, you suffered the pain and now you are who you are, right? Long-term gain requires short-term pain. And that's what I want to talk about just real quick because, you know, as entrepreneurs, man, we put so much pressure on ourselves. And I want to remind you that you are doing something new almost every single day. Like almost every day you're doing something new. Now, some days don't feel like that. It's like, oh, man, I'm bashing my head against the wall. I'm doing the same thing over and over and over. But most of the time, you're still doing something new every day. You hired someone and you have to deal with a new personality type, whatever, doing with a new client type, whatever it is. And I want to encourage you to stop beating yourself up, okay? Stop expecting perfection from an imperfect process. Stop 
expecting perfection from an imperfect process. And I'm telling you this because I do this to myself. I've done, I've been guilty of all this stuff, right? And I know that I see it's a common thing amongst entrepreneurs is we tend to beat ourselves up and then we go, you know what, this, uh, what am I even doing? And then we start self-doubt, limiting beliefs, and it starts this negative cycle. It's almost negative momentum that we create for ourselves, right? And this is one of the reasons why so many people, so many entrepreneurs get, they, they just never replace themselves. They never replace themselves in business. They get stuck. And this is why they can't grow a business. This is why they get stuck in that first phase of entrepreneurship, which is sad, but true. It, it is the most difficult phase of being a business owner. It's the, it's the most difficult way, right, is doing everything yourself. And because we try something and we don't get immediate results or a perfect process, we hire someone, it doesn't work out exactly the way we thought, then we, we just retreat, right? It gets tough and it's like, you know what? I'm just going to retreat. Um, it, was easier th it was easier before, right? Are you guys with me? Have you done this before? <laughs> Are you guilty of this? And it's because as entrepreneurs, we, we tend to love building, but we hate growing. And I'm just telling you, embrace the suck, right? Um, learn to uh, learn from the pain and don't get distracted by those shiny objects because they'll come into your life and you'll go, well, I'm going to try, try this instead. And then you realize you're not really progressing. You're just trying a bunch of different routes along the way. And really you haven't progressed or changed or moved at all. And you, you tend to just keep trying the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And we think we're going to find some solution to our problems when in reality, the solution is usually right in front of us. And that's, that solution is short-term pain for long-term gain. And um, I, just, I just know this by experience, guys. And, and that's really what I'm trying to do is help others learn from my experiences, both positive and negative. And there are times where we are just too hypercritical of ourselves and we're like, man, you know, I must be doing it wrong. I might, you know, whatever. And it's good to be, to, you know, to be a critical thinker and try to solve problems and stuff like that. But we also have to sometimes just pause, congratulate ourselves for the, the progress that we've made and understand that it's not a perfect process. So um, do the work. Don't expect it to be a perfect process. Okay. Shit happens. I'm sorry to, to tell you that. Um, and it's okay. Right. It doesn't mean you are a failure. It's kind of like sales. You know, I, I remember my uh, first sales trainer told me this. It was like, it's just a game of no's. You know, the more the, the more no's you get, the closer you are to a yes. And at the time I was like, that kind of sounds like BS. <laughs> like, it sounds like you're just trying to like, it make me feel better temporarily, whatever. But it's actually very true. Like, in any, you know, depending on whatever product, service, whatever you're selling, you're never going to get 100%, right? And so, the more no's you can get through, the closer you are to those yeses. And if you're experiencing pain, if you're experiencing problems, again, that, that doesn't mean that you're a failure. It just means that you're breaking through, you're growing, you're learning, and you're learning sometimes in, in some cases what not to do. What's up, Michael Kaplan? What's up, Tom Garber? Good to see you guys. Thanks for being here. So if you guys are experiencing growing pains right now, you are definitely on the right track. It's a sign of growth. Uh, it means you're stronger than you were yesterday. And that is what you should uh, focus on. You should congratulate yourselves. Don't beat yourself up. Uh, don't make it harder on yourself than it has to be. And just remember, keep moving forward. So all light, all light, all light. I think it's time to uh, welcome our guest. Are you guys ready? If you are ready and you are here live, let me know. And we will do the thing. So let's get the music cued, shall we? What up? Welcome to the show, Mr. Roger Ramsey. How are you, man? I'm doing great, man. I appreciate the invite. Thank you. Man, I'm excited to hang out for a little bit. Um, and I wasn't kidding. Everywhere I go, it doesn't matter like what trade show I go to. I mean, are, do you even go to like the lingerie ones? Because like 
even somewhere I'm like not expecting you. I'm like, wait, why is he here? <laughs> uh, you got to stay plugged into the industry and even the peripheral of the industry, right? Um, to really know what's going on, what's happening out in the market. As a category manager, right? I'm responsible for making decisions company wide with inventory. But you got to get out there. You got to get out into the market. You got to visit your stores. You got to visit your competitor stores. And you just got to have an understanding of what people want, what people need, and find those differentiators to try to position yourself better. Yeah, it's one thing that honestly, I've always been impressed with Ewing because um, it's, and I'm, I'm sure like, I don't even know how many locations Ewing has, but it, it can't be like 100% success rate. But in my experience, like I've met you, I've met everyone I've met isn't just like a uh, order taker you know mm -hmm. they you guys actually know your stuff and it's it's almost like surprising because if you've dealt with any other like distributor and in, even in different industries sometimes you like go to them to ask a question to get an answer and it's like well i don't know and then like they're googling and you're like well i mean i have google too like what yeah what is this so is that something that's like internal in ewing or did i just luck out with the few people that i know well, you've had some really good people. Uh, Craig Freeman, well, one of the best, right? Uh, but the reality of it is, is it's a cultural thing. Our, our company culture is strive for service excellence. It's number four in our mission statement. And so, you know, when I was in sales prior to category management, that's really what we strive for is we strive to be a business partner to the customer because if the customer doesn't grow, we don't grow as a distributor. And so by helping that customer achieve and get to the next level and all of the the previous things you were talking about, the, the growing pains, right? Success is a poor teacher, man. You learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. And that's pretty much tried and true in everything we do in life. But we really try to encourage and foster that, that sense of training, that sense of engagement with the customer to become part of their business and make sure that, you know, their success is our success. So awesome. it's more, it's more of a cultural thing. Yeah. It feels like that. It really does. Um, and again, I, I can't imagine it would be like a hundred percent success rate, but it, it, it still feels right. So what's up, Ryan Jaso, uh, doing Jason. his best, best to watch the great Roger Ramsey live with the, uh, post internet, uh, from the hurricane. It's the boss. Yeah. So, um, all right. So tell me just, uh, I guess introduce yourself real quick to our audience. Uh, how long have you been doing this? Because I'm not kidding. Uh, everywhere I go, you're there, you're learning, you're, you're, investing in yourself and your company and stuff like that. But how long have you been doing like landscape lighting? So I was a grower in a previous life. I grew high in retail back in Virginia, um, you know, concrete floors, flood irrigation, you know, spared no expense, so to speak. And then when I moved out to Phoenix back in 1996, I grew really low in wholesale. So it was pretty tough, right? I was making chicken salad out of chicken crap. I can make it look good, but I couldn't make it taste good. It's not really easy growing things here in the desert Southwest to begin with. Uh, and I did that for about four years. And then I was selling poinsettias to Ewing Irrigation annually. And uh, one of the guys that was coming by the nursery and buying the poinsettias about the third year just took it upon himself to hire me. And he just was tenacious. He wouldn't let go. And he kept coming by and kept visiting with me. And I was kind of in a dead end job being a grower. You know, it's a complete commitment. Um, and that's kind of my, it fits my personality. I align with it, but at the same time, it's, it's a, it's a burden, right? Not having days off, you know, plants don't care if it's Tuesday or Christmas, they don't care if it's Wednesday, sunny, cloudy, you know, there's all these variables that go into, into making a, a, a good crop, a quality crop. And if you miss something, then the end result, the quality of the crop suffers. And it's a direct reflection of your engagement, your involvement, your, your commitment to the process. And so, you know, I said, you know, what the heck, I'll just go over here to this Ewing Irrigation. I'll work here for a few years and figure out what I want to do with my career beyond that and uh, see where it leads. And what happened was I came aboard uh, in May of, 2000, of 2020, I'm sorry, 2000, May of 2000. And we were just starting to ramp up on landscape lighting. And, you know, my father's a union electrician. I kind of know my way around electricity. Uh, it was a growing category at the time. And I just saw a ton of opportunity. Nobody was doing anything with it as far as championing a, a specific product category. And so from a sales standpoint, within six months, I worked my way into a landscape lighting salesman job, right? A, a, a specialty products or outdoor living sales category salesman. And uh, I just started championing it. I grew into developing a like, reputation for myself here in Arizona. Arizona is a perfect market for landscape lighting. 
I uh, got to know all the top customers, worked closely with them, did design, did troubleshooting, did training for their crews. And then as Ewing grew, I grew with Ewing and I would go back east when we moved into the southeast and I would do some training back east and start hitting all the trade shows and getting to know some larger customers. And with that came vendor relationships, partnering with the vendors that were selling product to Ewing and uh, spent about 12 years in sales. And then uh, my former boss, he retired. And so it afforded me the opportunity to move, to move into category management. And what that meant was I was shifting from helping contractors to developing our people and working with our people, both at the counter, out in the field and as account managers in sales, and just championing the, the product category, making it easy, making it fun, making it profitable, you know, basically just bringing light to people's careers. Love it. That's awesome, man. Well, you uh, have done a, obviously a good job and you obviously like what you're doing because you've been doing it a while. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about, you know, from a, for the contractors that are out there, the lighting designers that are out there. Um, what, what is their, what is the role of distributor? Uh, like what, how do you guys view that at, as, as a support arm to them? So uh, today's, you know, if you look at all the different channels that they're, they're blurred, right? Uh, you know, the, the market strategy between uh, for any distributor, whether it's an importer, a direct to contractor distributor that ships direct and all of that. We, we have over 230 locations nationwide. Uh, we try for the most part to stay in the Sun Belt where we can stay busy year round, but we've got some colder climate um, markets like Michigan, like Utah, the Pacific Northwest gets pretty cold, Colorado, different markets up in the, up in the New York. And uh, what we try to do is become a local reliable resource for the contractor. And that's not just product, all right? It, it involves product. But it's also solutions, right? You know, you, we want to be a solution provider because that's what, how you partner with a contractor. And so in doing so, we try to keep inventory close at hand. We try to eliminate the conflict between buy agreements and case quantity purchases and all of that that's available online. Because, again, there's no real clear, distinct channels in distribution anymore. You can buy direct online. You, you can go into a brick and mortar location. You could do a hybrid of both, right? Buy online and pick up in store. There's so many opportunities for the landscape contractor or the homeowner alike for that matter. And so I just believe in keeping inventory close to close to the customer and keeping enough inventory, enough depth of stock to be able to fill an order over the counter. Now that's not a project-based sale. That's an over-the-counter sale. Project-based sales tend to be specialty items and boutique product, you know, special stem heights and different beam spreads and different integrated or drop in or whatever the case may be. Those are, you know, those are project based sales. But what we really focus on is staying narrow and deep. We know what the customers are going to want to buy, whether it's a wall wash, a path light, an up light, uh, several different up lights, regardless of what the product mix looks like. And we try to keep that inventory in stock in enough volume to fill an over the counter sale that's not exceptionally large. Yeah. And then with market density, multiple stores in a given market, we can lean on our other stores to help fulfill the need of an immediate uh, you know, project that needs to be shipped out and go out. It also buffers us from supply chain issues. Right. Yeah. So. I think I think um, I mean, we like I said, getting started, we used Ewing as like our main uh, distributor, you know, but even yeah. as we grew and started to take advantage of the ability to use the internet do online orders or now we had more cash where we could buy bulk orders or something like that i still felt like we had to maintain that strong relationship because you do solve such a, a problem of those daily activities and being there close and um inventory on hand you go to a client's house and all of a sudden they're like hey while you're here can you add those 10 lights that you know i told you no at the sales pitch but now you showed up when you said you would and now i actually forgot that I'm rich. <laughs> um, let's just add those. We had experiences like that. I'm not kidding. And not just like once every year, like this was almost weekly. And we would call, I'd call Craig or I'd call Kurt and be like, Hey, can you, I don't know if you guys can do this. We need 10 path lights. Yep. No problem. And it's like, sometimes within an hour, they were like delivered to the job site. And I was like, wow. I mean that, that goes a long way in my book for building loyalty and relationships and all that. Well, because you're, you're actually looking at the intrinsic value of the relationship overall, not just the product cost, right? I mean, we're moving into holiday lighting season and it's fast and furious. I told you earlier, it's, it's hitting earlier than it has uh, in the years past. Uh, but the reality of it is, is you can go online and make any number of purchases for holiday lighting and 
you can find product cheaper, but you're going to pay freight to land it. You're going to wait for it. You're going to have to order minimal order quantities, usually typically case quantities. Uh, Warranty is a pain. Um, you know, returns are a pain because usually there's freight involved in all of that. Whereas there is a definite need for a reliable local supplier of goods and services. And when you have people of knowledge that can actually help you walk, help you walk through problems, find solutions, uh, even if it's just shorts and outs, because you're, you're buying the bulk of your purchases online, you're going to gravitationally shift more and more business over to that distributor because it's an enjoyable relationship. You know, you, you just, you get to a point where you feel like I got your back. Yeah, you can lean on us. We've got your back. And uh, there's a value in that, an intrinsic value that you don't always put a dollar sign on, but it's there. And whether you realize it consciously or subconsciously, uh, you know, you, you'll buy into it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's the advantage you guys have over like the manufacturers or even the other distributors online, you know, like they they can add a lot more value. Like, I mean, Jay, I don't know if Jay's so still on here, but like they are, they specialize in landscape lighting. So that's, I mean, that's there's not a lot of distributors that do that right and so no, he's awesome they're, they're gonna have their competitive advantage is gonna be that education and stuff like that but the one thing they can't have is those 260 or 220 locations or whatever you said so i feel like it's important for lighting contractors to have a few different relationships where they can rely on different arms for different parts of their business because and that's one thing i just don't think that anyone can solve except for the Ewings that have all those, like you guys can solve that local uh, relationship. You can take people out to lunch. I mean, I was like, I'm still friends with these guys, you know? Yeah. So um, you you can't really, that, that level of loyalty is really, really hard to compete with. Yeah. And it is nice having, you know, multiple stores, having that market density and markets that are large enough to support um, having several stores in a given market, because we do supply chain. If it's taught us anything, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. And yeah. if you are putting all your eggs in one basket, that basket needs to be big enough to where, you know, the relationship's intimate enough to where they'll move product around to fit whatever the need is. Like you said, I mean, you know, we'll deliver the product all day long. I so. think I may have just brokered a deal. I, the good I know, news I is that. I only take 2%. I mean, I'm just a connector. <laughs> so, um, what it's just 2% of the total transaction. It's, it's not, it's, it's nothing. You guys won't even notice. All right. Just add that on, add two percent on JSO to your sales price. We'll be good. <laughs> That's awesome. That, that literally might be a good conversation. We'll just take this one offline, okay, guys? <laughs> it's all good. Um, all right. So we talked a little bit about that. Like, what what should the expectation from a contractor be? Like, they're like, okay, well, I've never heard of Ewing, or I've heard of Ewing, but I didn't know they did that much lighting or whatever it is. Like, should they go in and expect you guys to? be these like product wizards should they like are you going to help them with quotes are you going to help them with demos like what what should their expectations be when they're coming in that's really a strength of ours is this the, the customer engagement out over the counter right you're going to get a different experience depending on what store you walk in and who you interact with you know if you get a new guy that's just kind of feeling his way and trying to figure out where what everything is and where it is and that kind of thing it's going to be a different experience than meeting the manager or an account manager that kind of knows his way around the store and knows his way around the job site and can help you make decisions as far as selection, um, fixing issues, solving problems, slip fixes, irrigation, whatever the case may be. But the reality of it is, is we lean on each other all the time internally at Ewing. And so we're not afraid to ask each other for help. We're not afraid to call a salesperson and say, hey, I, I need I need help with this guy. He's asking me questions. I don't have any answers to it. And we try to get back to people. I mean, it's not going to be a, a perfect conversation every time because you're dealing with different people with different skill sets uh, and a different knowledge base. But really, I mean, we're very good at partnering with these cost customers as they're coming in and as, as, as they're growing their business, uh, turning them on new opportunities. Right. If you're doing, you know, landscape lighting, you ever thought about down lighting, uh, you know, you thought about strip lighting, a linear light source that you're not used to seeing from everybody else. That'll differentiate your business from everybody else's. Uh, nice. Your job will look different from other people's uh, introducing color into the landscape, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, that's actually one of the things that really pissed me off about um, Ewing and specifically Craig Freeman. Let me just call him out. Uh, let's call him out. Yeah. Let's just do that. He, he was so good at that, that I found out that he was actually helping a landscaper sell lighting against me. 
of all people, he's out there <laughs> doing demos for them. He's out there doing their sales, like not just like telling them what to say, but doing the sell for them. And I'm just like, what? What kind of service le level of service? No one does this. Like no one does this level of service. And uh, I give him a hard time, but I, I think that's awesome. Like you know, like that was just a classic example of like how far you guys are, like what you're willing to do. And uh, I thought it was awesome. You know, I I'm not ever gonna let him live it down, but. That that level of service is is hard to find for sure. All right, that, that's how you learn lighting is at night. All right, you don't learn lighting in a classroom environment or reading a book or watching a video on YouTube. You learn it by going out. You learn fixture placement. You learn fixture selection, right? Uh, light intensity, color temperature. You learn all of that in the field, right? That's your canvas at night, and that's exactly where you learn landscape lighting. And Craig's passionate about what he does, and he's done a lot of night demos. And from that comes the confidence. I mean, you can speak on lighting confidently when you understand it, you own it, you know it. It's a three-dimensional art. And the more time you spend at night involving yourself, committing to the process, learning how to light this and that, overcoming obstacles, problems, figuring out how to light this when you don't have any, any place to place the fixture. You still try to got to figure out a, a, you know, a solution to the situation, to the, 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 you know, whatever the subject is and whatever footprint of real estate you have to put the fixture. You yeah. learn quickly how to do that. And, you know, hats off to guys like Freeman. Um, you know, Freeman's a rare breed. And, I, you know, I cut my teeth from the same cloth that Freeman did. And when you go out and you, you, you work with customers like that, most of the guys aren't going to become you. Most of the guys aren't going to be a, a lighting artisan or, you know, a professional landscape lighting guy. Sometimes it's just helping a landscaper provide lighting for a client that's been very important to them, that has a lot of friends, you know, uh, affluent friends that will also buy from them and overcoming that obstacle of getting into landscape lighting, Le you know, learning, you know, it doesn't take a lot to be pretty good at lighting. I mean, you yeah. know, for, you know, you can use the best product in the world and you put it in the wrong hands that it's not going to look good at the end of the job. Yeah. I'm, I love doing demos. Uh, some people are like, well, I've never done a demo and I'm a billionaire whatever. That's fine. But demos like I'm with you hundred percent. If someone's new into the industry, I'm like, go buy some temporary lights and throw them up on your house. And you'll be surprised how much you can learn in just even one night. Not yeah. that you're going to know everything, but you move a light fixture back one inch or move it forward one inch. It's going to get that much brighter or half that intensity. I mean, it's crazy how much you can learn. And, you know, you read it in a book. That's one thing. But to actually see it. And that's what, like you said, gives you the confidence. I remember selling jobs and they're like, how do you know how it's going to like, how, how do you know? I'm like, well. Man, when you've when you've looked at that many lights at night, you know exactly what it's going to look like. You know, the funny part about it, and, and Ryan can probably attest to this: you get so good at selling lighting that you get to a point where you don't have to do demos anymore because you just carry yourself and you speak with such confidence. On when you're walking the project, I would do this here for this reason, that reason. That I would use this beam angle. I'd use this beam spread. You just go through all of this stuff with the client. And it's almost like it's, it's necessitated by the sick, the point that you've already been out three nights that week and you don't want to do another demo. Right. And so doing the demo makes you accustomed and acclimated to actually selling product much more effectively because you're speaking from a, from a position of knowledge. You're confident with what you're saying to the client and you're selling jobs like you're mentioning Freeman selling the job to, uh, you know, for the landscaper to the homeowner. That's common because you've done it. You've been around the block more times than the sidewalk. You know what you're doing. You can speak, you can speak upon what they want and what their desires are. I mean, selling anything is about solving. It, it's you're selling everything you sell for one of two reasons, you're either satisfying desire, desire, or you're solving a problem, right? It's basically a want or a need. And what's cool about outdoor living and landscape lighting in particular is it solves both. You have safety implications, you know, burglary steps, elevation changes, all of that. But there's also the emotional aspect of it. And when you can blend those together, that's a high profitable sale and it's a fun sale, right? It, you're going to you're going to get a lot out of that transaction. It's going to lead to better, bigger transactions. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with with all that. Um, let's do this. We're going to take a, a quick break and we're going to play our game. So if you guys are here live and you want me to pay you and bribe you to listen to the show, then you're in luck because that's what we're going to do right now. So uh, let's find the buttons. Roger, are you ready to play? I'm ready to play, but I can't answer. Yeah, just, you're going to know the answer. I don't want to give it away. We got to hype it up. It's got to be this big thing. So if you know the answer, just hold it to yourself. All right. Whoa, one, one. Cool. 
card giveaway. All right. It's everyone's favorite time of the show. It's gift card giveaway. So uh, the rules are pretty simple. Uh, if you're here live, just put in the chat uh, the answer. If you are the first person to answer this question correctly, you win 50 bucks. I'm just going to send you a, uh, I don't know if it's Visa. It's just a gift card. Okay. I don't know. remember what brand it is. But we're going to send it out to you. So if you get this right and you're the first one, then I'll announce the winner and then just shoot me a message in Facebook Messenger and we'll get your address and everything and ship it out to you. So you guys ready to play? Here is the question. Roger, be on your best behavior, okay? Don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> All right. Blank is a measure of the ability of a light source to reveal the colors of objects faithfully as compared to an ideal or natural full spectrum light source. So blank is a measure of the ability of a light source to reveal the colors of objects faithfully as compared to an ideal or natural full spectrum light source. So if you know the answer, just post it in the comments and I will hook you up uh, and just give you free money. I mean, I don't even know why I'm doing this actually. I don't know if we have like stats that say, oh, when you started gift card giveaway that your uh, viewership went up or anything like I don't know. I think I was just like, you know, I just want to give some money away. All right. We got a couple of people guessing Facebook user and Ryan Jaso. But the first person, does anyone else want to guess? They're guessing. Uh, <laughs> shoot. Am I? I hope I'm not having Internet issues. I'm not even close to Florida. I should be fine. <laughs> Um, the question <laughs> blank is a measure of the ability of a light source to reveal the colors of objects faithfully as compared to an ideal or natural full spectrum light source. Anyway, it's kind of anticlimactic. Jay, so you got it right. CRI, you were the first person to get it correctly. Sorry to whoever else answered that correctly because, uh, you were just probably seconds behind Ryan J. So, so, all right. Giving you free money, man. I'll uh, I'll hook you up with the uh, the fifty bucks. So, all right. Thanks for playing, guys. That was another episode of Gift Card Giveaway. All right, that wasn't too bad, right, Roger? That was a good one, man. Color rendering index. I got you, hundred yeah. percent. Uh, for bonus points, what's the highest value that CRI can can be? You can answer that. Does anyone know that? Is it ten thousand? One hundred. Is it 100? Yeah, yeah, 100. yeah. So, um, yeah, it's 100. And actually, I learned this uh, just the other day. Um, I thought it was zero to 100, but I think it's like high pressure sodium or something like that is like ne it's a negative CRI. It's negative? Well, it's horrible, man. Yeah. You have no like, color rendition. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't know that. I thought it was like zero to 100. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and if you are uh, like, okay, what is CRI color rendering index? It's basically like, have you ever, if you ever like, like if you get like fruit and go put it on your countertop right now, yeah. if your lights have like low CRI, they look like crap, like they're dying, right? But in the produce section, you're like, wow, that looks really colorful and everything, right? So they're using like color, you know, a higher color temperature and higher CRI to, to pull those colors out. But it is uh, funny how they use colored colors to like magnify the attractiveness of objects. Yeah. So it, it, CRI really does matter. And, so like some people are like, well, man, I got this light. It was, you know, 20 bucks less than another. And it's the same thing. Look, it looks exactly the same. Well, it might be, or it might not be. It might be, you know, the components that went into it and everything else. So CRI does matter. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've seen it. You put like these two lights and you compare them and they both say they're 3000 K or whatever. You put it on there and you're like, why does one make the tree look awesome? And why does one make the tree look dead? Probably CRI. So, all right. Um, okay. So I wanted to ask you about lighting. I mean, you, you've seen lighting kind of go from, I mean, I, I got into it in 2007 and when I started, it was halogen. Um, so I've, I've experienced some of the change, but um, how has lighting changed for you over the past 20 years? Well, I can remember the reluctance for contractors to switch over to LED. Um, initially it was a cost factor. Uh, and then the cost issue started, it was, you know, as it was, minimizing and, and you kind of taking away that reluctance, there was still this, you know, desire to hang on to halogen. All right. It's a nice, soft, warm, intimate, inviting look. People enjoyed it. Um, they really appreciated it. Um, 
now I, I don't think you can find halogen anymore. It's actually illegal in some states, <laughs> right? The, the efficiency ratings is too low. You can't buy the lamps. And so I think everything for a while now has been shifted over to LED. Uh, like I said, moving into holiday, you know, you're so limited with your electrical infrastructure with incandescence that you just couldn't do what you can do now. Uh, the evolution's just big time. Um, you know, when you can take a string of lights and plug 45 of them in end to end, 43 of them end to end versus three incandescents before you start popping those little fuses in the plugs, it's a big deal. From a landscape lighting standpoint, I mean, look at what look at what LED's done to voltage drop, right? Now, I mean, you can still mess it up and people do it all the time. But the reality of it is, is, you know, you can daisy chain 10, 12 lights. And as long as you don't have high powered LEDs and you're not talking some crazy distances, you can get away with it. Where before you just couldn't do it. You just you had too much variable light output from incandescence. Uh, the last one wasn't bright enough. This first one, you're burning too much. You know, your bulbs burning out too soon because you're pumping too much voltage into the first one to fix the last one. Um, it's just fixed a lot of things. It's made things a lot easier, but it's also in some regards taken away some of the artisan, the artisanry of, of lighting, right? Being able to use different cables, cable sizes, multi-tap tra transformers and everything else to really do it right. Yeah. And so it's no, made it easy. So. Yeah, it's been kind of tough because like you said, it makes it easier and people are like, oh, cool. I don't, so I don't have to, they're not as delicate. I can just hook yeah. up all the lights. And for the most part, they really can but yeah. we still find people like messing it up. So then we know, okay, we got a special breed here. We, we got to spend some time here. And I think the reason why people get messed up is because of the difference between wattage and VA. And a lot of manufacturers still publish that number like, oh, it's a four watt lamp or five watt lamp. And when in reality, it's consuming, you know, it's seven VA or eight or whatever it is. Yeah. And that's that will get them into trouble because it's almost twice uh as high as they were kind of calculating in their head and the, the less expensive the product the more the, the delta between uh wattage and va um yep. the better built the product is the closer the va aligns with the wattage yeah i've That's seen that been too. my experience yeah I've, I've i've seen that too um and i i just don't i just don't think people are thinking about that and then like you said like people then it's like, oh, well, anyone can do it. So you'll get these people that are like, well, I'll just throw in these lights on this project I'm doing with this outdoor kitchen or landscaping or whatever. And it's not really done with any type of design element or anything. It's just like throw some up lights on here. And because the consumers, the homeowners aren't really educated on it. They're like, this looks great. That's right. So they now have now they've got this weird view of lighting, you know. If so you think about it, though, if you're going from nothing to lighting, even if it's not good lighting, it's better than what you had because what you had was nothing. I know. Well, that's what I tell people when they're getting started. I'm like, listen, if I could go back and look at my first hundred jobs, I promise I'd be like, oh, that sucks. But yep. guess what? All my customers, they loved me. They gladly paid me the fee because they had nothing. And so they thought I actually knew what I was doing, right? So don't be intimidated by it. Go out and just get it done. You, you don't have to worry like – because kind of like when I was, I was opening my opening, like monologue, it's like, we're, we're not going to ever be perfect. You know, there's yeah. always going to be something to learn. There's always gonna be something to be better. Maybe we should have used more downlighting on that project, or maybe we should have thrown in a linear or something like that. But um, the point is, as long as you're putting your best foot forward and really looking at it from the customer standpoint, if it's solving their problems, you know? Well, you can always go back to, to existing customers, uh, you know, for a renovation and, you know, apply new skill sets and uh, expanded product offerings that you now offer that you didn't offer back when you installed their lighting. You know, maybe it's gutter mounted lights uh, on the second story. Maybe it's an outdoor sound system in the backyard around the pool. I mean, you can always continue to expand your product offering as your skills, skill level increases. We should do, they should do that. Just send an email and say, Hey, I did your lighting three years ago. I actually didn't know what I was doing then. Uh, we were just getting started, <laughs> but now we can do second story uh, lights and now we can core drill and all this stuff. Well, what's all funny right. is when you see a slowdown in the economy and new builds slow down, you see a lot of maintenance companies shift to revenue enhancement. And that's exactly what it is. It's an established mm -hmm. relationship only instead of, uh, you know, just showing up for a half an hour, an hour, taking care of a backyard, they're making recommendations. They're recommending replacing the light fixture that got run over or actually adding lighting uh, where it didn't exist to begin with, or adding other aspects of it, fertigation systems, uh, so, the, so the landscape's always being fertilized, that kind of thing. 
just to increase revenue because the build side of the business has slowed down. Well, I mean, maintenance is kind of its own topic because some people are like, wait, I didn't know I could do maintenance with lighting. I didn't know yeah. I could do maintenance contracts. And that is one of those things that's highly overlooked. Um, if you're not maintaining your systems, you're missing out on one, providing your client the highest level of service possible and really over delivering and everything to make sure their lighting looks good just because it's LED. And even if it has a 10 year warranty, 20 year, what doesn't really matter, it's not going to look the same as it did on day one, just six months later, you know? Yeah. So maintenance is huge. And we found that most of our repeat business and our referrals was a direct reflection from our maintenance people because they were, they were happy with their lights. We saw our trucks in those gated neighborhoods that you couldn't put yard signs up. And so people see you more active. So there's just so many reasons why it makes sense to perform maintenance for lighting and your customers will thank you for it. They'll, they'll pay you and thank you. It's not that cumbersome either. I mean, you're just staying in front of the customer and you know, you don't have to do it every week, uh, but go back to lighting projects and you just, you know, make sure everything's tip top. Yep. So, so um, what, are there any like uh, signs or of like, new technology or trends you're seeing or just random roger thoughts of what, where you see the the lighting industry going over the next you know 10 to or five to ten years i'd say well so you're seeing the technology i mean it's control a lot of it's on the control side right you're, there's less and less transformers and more and more controllers uh meaning that it's not just a simple on-off operation it's integrated it's integrated into smart home technology it's app based over your phone uh, you're, you're, you're gaining a lot more control and with that you get technological advances like color changing and intensity and saturation points and all of that, you know, a lot of it is stuff people don't really use. All right. It's like when you buy a new television, right? <laughs> you, you're doing the Pepsi challenge. You, you got everything written down. Okay. This TV does Roku, it does all this other stuff. And then you get it home and you turn it on and off. You turn the volume up and down and you switch channels and that's pretty much it, but it does other things if you want it to. You see on the lighting side, a lot of sales are like that. People will buy product they, they'll never use just because they can afford to buy it in case they ever wanted to use it. And so you see some of that happening. Um, I, I can tell you right now, I think a lot of those uh, upgrades are being sold by the contractor or by the designer. I, I think when it comes to landscape lighting overall, people are, have a pretty complex lifestyle, sometimes more complex than they really want to begin with. They don't want to worry about whether or not their lights are coming on and off and they don't really care about color. They just want to make sure that they don't have to think about it. Right. It comes on at dusk and it turns off at 11 PM or whatever, and you can synchronize it to where you have multiple transformers. So the whole yard comes on and off at the same time, but you don't want to have to manage uh, the control of your landscape lighting. You want to set it and forget it. And that's still a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people spend money on uh, options and benefits and, and features that they'll never use. Yeah, I agree. It, you know, for me, my opinion of it, I guess, depends on like my customer and also like what my competition is doing. Because if I have someone that's promoting it, yeah. then I would say exactly what you just said. And, and I, I would do that. I'd be like, they would say, well, this guy said he could do this. I'm like, well, we could do that too. But here's why we we're not going to. Because Unless we, you want it. If they say they want it, then that's okay. But but they don't know about the problems that can happen with Wi-Fi connectivity or Bluetooth. Yeah. So it's a matter of just educating on that. And my point is, it doesn't really matter what you're pushing. If you're pushing that, great. If you're not, just find what your competitive advantage is and, and make yourself special and make sure you educate your client on what makes you different than the other person. So I tend to agree more with you. I'm like, hey, less technology. Uh, I'm trying to dummy it down. Like, listen, at the end of the day, you just want your lights to turn on, right? Yeah. And a lot of contractors don't like, you know, um, you know your your interface, your your Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and all of that because of the callback issues. Yeah. I mean, it's windshield time. It's time away from family, typically, or time away from a, a job that you're still working on to get paid for. The product's getting blamed, but it's not the product, right? It's the connectability of the product or a misuse of the application or they messed something up and they can't get it back to the way it was, you know, programming issues and that kind of thing. Um, I, I completely understand why people want to keep it simple for the most part. I really do. Yeah. All right. So you've met, 
I don't know, you've, you've had to met hundreds, if not thousands of contractors over the years. Um, what, what do you think most, uh, lighting contractors struggle with the most? I think a lot of it is, uh, selling the project, um, articulating what they can do for the client. I've met I said, there's the uh, landscape lighting. When I was in sales, it was basically two different categories. It was production based where they didn't want to be lighting artisans. They didn't care to be the best of the best of the best of the best and no color temperature and, you know, and all, and all of that. But what they did want to do is they just wanted to turn and burn. They wanted to use the same product all the time, which fits wholesale distribution from a product stocking standpoint. Uh, but they came, they kept running across the same problems, right? The same field issues, insulation issues, especially back in halogen, right? Overloading and breaker issues and bad connections and that kind of stuff. Uh, on the other side of that coin is the lighting artisan that's that takes everything super serious. They, they're they're experts at what they do, but they have a hard time sometimes articulating that, and especially the cost of their system versus the guy that just wants to turn and burn product. Whether it's a quality issue of product itself, whether it's the installation, whether it's the cabling, the proper connections, and all the other aspects that go into a quality job above and beyond somebody that's production based or production minded, right? Yeah. Um, what I found is, you know, once you become a solution provider, you're not selling anymore. You're solving problems. And when you're solving problems, you can attain a higher fee from the client and you're a better partner. Like from my standpoint, helping a contractor, they are, they're relying upon me to help them sell the project. Um, from a homeowner standpoint, you know, there, there's a trust. One, relationships are nothing more than trust. It's influence. And when you can make suggestions, right, and, and just, you know, solution-based selling to the client, it goes a long way. Think about a hardscape install, right? If you don't put lighting in before the pavers are down, if you don't run their wire, if you don't have the infrastructure in place, if you don't think about lighting a hardscape, an outdoor kitchen until after it's already built, well, it's a lot more expensive to add it now, right? And so that those little nuggets of, of suggestion to, you know, even if you don't have budget for it, let's run the wire now. And that way, when you want to add lighting, the lighting is in place, but it's going to be best if we just install the lighting with the hardscape. So we place, put it in place as the hardscape's going in. And then yeah. you make suggestions on putting lights inside of barbecue cabinets. So the critters aren't hiding in there. And so you can see when you're reaching in or drawers so that when you're reaching in for a knife, it's lit, you know, that just stupid little things that they're, they're, you're just, it's upselling, but at the same time, you're solving problems. Yeah. I love that. It's a problem before it's identified as an issue. That's great advice. Um, that's great advice. I think there are a lot of people out there that are really good at what they do, whether it's like their design. It's like, holy cow, how'd they even come up with that? I would have never thought of that. Or they're really good installers. Like they're going to win installer of the year if there's ever an installer of the year award. Right. But they do kind of suck at business. They do kind of suck at sales. And if we can help them get that confidence and do that solution based selling and the stuff that you're talking about, they're going to be that much more successful and they can share their passion because they're, they're really passionate about it. They love, they love what they do. They're good at what they do, but they need to, they need to work on their sales and they, they feel guilty. Like, well, I shouldn't have to sell it. Well, in reality, sometimes you do, you know, because yeah. there's someone out there like me that's actually really good at sales and is going to convince them to go with my company instead of yours because of our sales presentation. Even if you're a better designer at, at the end of the day, might not be communicated effectively enough for that homeowner to make that decision. So, so one of the other things too, is, uh, you know, you get to the need, um, you get to the want by selling the need, by filling the need, right. Uh, it's, you know, you're getting into fall right now. You've got some clients that have relatives coming over for Thanksgiving. You got these singular double steps, those low elevation changes that aren't always perceptible. If you fall down a flight of steps, you need to pay better attention, maybe lay off the bottle or stop texting or whatever the case may be. Right. But, you know, the single and double steps hurt people. And so I can tell you, I can personal, personal experience where I've been called out on a job for that particular issue, right? Where, you know, neighbor got broken into or we need, we need to address these steps right here. What would we do? You go out and do a night demo and you end up selling an entire backyard or front yard or entire project package. All right. You, you know, you, you lead with the need to get to the want. The want is an emotional desire for the landscape lighting package, for that look at night, for that extended use into the nighttime hours of their backyard landscape. They've already spent a lot of money on, but can't enjoy it at night because it's too dark, right? 
Um, so you basically solve an emotional desire through a practical need to solve a problem. And so that's another aspect of, of selling the project is you lead with the need. Love it. That's a great way to break it down. I mean, you, you've heard the saying, you know, people buy an emotion, defend with logic. And that's yes. exactly what you just described. It's like, of course, people want lighting, but yeah. then people don't think they need it, but they do. Like if you're a lighting professional and you're like, if you're as passionate about it as I am, I, I actually think that everyone needs lighting because I've had those experiences where someone fell down and got hurt. I've had those experiences where people regretted not having lighting because their house got broken into. Yeah. Like, what, so they, do they not need lighting? They need lighting. Right. And so if you can get them excited, get them emotionally involved and then defend that with logic, why it makes sense. then they do need these things because of safety, security. And then one, one that has come about in the last few years is emotional. I mean, we talk about mental health. Like, is that not a need to come? You have a hard day, you yeah. come home and you want to just a place to like enjoy the serenity and just relax and unwind and go sit in your backyard and look out at the view how that impacts your uh, mental health. I mean, if you're not bringing these things up, you're missing out on huge, huge opportunities in your sales process. Man, what you just mentioned, that's outdoor lighting 101. So basically you don't sell what it is, you sell what it does, right? All right, you're selling the benefits, right? And, and, and so an example would be, no one calls you up and says, hey, I want this size pump, I want some liner, I, you know, I want a waterfall, pondless waterfall, whatever. That's not what you're selling, right? You're selling the tranquil sound of water, washing away the stress of a long, hard day with a glass over a glass of wine with your, your significant other or a beer with your buddy, drowning out the traffic noise on the other side of your property or you know, with the street noise or whatever the case may be, the, the annoying neighbor, whatever it is. But you're selling the effect, right? You're selling what it does. You're not selling what it is. And that's that's a big part of outdoor living. That's the emotional sales aspect of it. Love it. That's awesome, man. Well, you've delivered some great uh, information, some great knowledge today. Uh, if someone's um, starting out or maybe they just want to get better, um, where can they go? Like, what's the best way to learn design and install? Obviously, do the demos and stuff like that. But I know you've put out like videos. I don't know if they're your videos, Ewing's, what? Like, is there a YouTube channel or do you guys have um, uh, your yeah, local? You can go to, to ewingirrigation.com, but we also have demo kits in local markets again customers what do they really want they want a reliable consistent source of inventory in a localized market so we have demo kits uh that the customer can use or we can partner with you and take get an account manager to go out with you or a branch manager to go out with you and just set up some lighting we've got demo kits that like you said earlier you know the best way to learn lighting is at night so you just kind of go you take it home for the weekend your daughter's having a birthday party or you having some friends over for the weekend football game's going to be on, whatever the case may be. We encourage our employees to do that, but we have demo kits that we, as loaners that we can loan out in most markets. And we also have vendor partnerships to where, you know, we can get product from the vendor. We can use vendor rep support to go out. If we don't have a Ewing person that can go out and do a night demo or help the cup client out, we, we you know, we can partner with the vendor and uh, set up an appointment to go out and do a night demo to help sell a job. Uh, to me, it's hands-on is the best way to learn it, but you can YouTube, you can watch the videos at youingirrigation.com. There's a lot of other aspects to learning lighting, but the best way to learn lighting is in the field, into that, in that three-dimensional environment at night. Love that. Yeah. I mean, if I was getting started today, I didn't know anything. I would literally go to, uh, just go to Ewing and say, Hey, Roger said something about a demo. I can't, I, can't, I wasn't listening, but he said yeah. something about a demo kit. And then, uh, then they'd be like, yeah, okay. And I'm like, you know what I've got, can we do it on my own house? And then I would do a Facebook post and say, hey, I'm doing a free demo if anyone's interested. Yeah. And someone in my neighborhood, I would go sell them lights and I would tell them I'm going to give it to them at cost or whatever. And all of a sudden now you got before and after pictures of two different projects at different angles. So now it looks like eight different projects and you're in business. So a lot of people do complicate it. Take advantage of there's so many people in this industry that are willing to help. Uh, you are a phenomenal resource. So friend requests, you're going to get like 10,000 friend requests right now. Uh, Roger Ramsey. Uh, literally this guy knows more than Google. So if, whatever question you have, if Roger, don't disappoint me. If you, if you, uh, answer one of their questions wrong, we're going to be in trouble, but I've already answered one wrong, but that's okay. I was thinking, uh, <laughs> color temp. Well, 
I, it's 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 a live show. I do just so everyone knows. I do give everyone the warning. Anything you say can and will be used against you. It's live. There's no editing, so uh, it's not easy. It's not easy being in the in the hot seat here. But um, uh, I've really enjoyed uh, getting to know you over the years and bumping into you in different places. Uh, we ran into each other last at Light Fair. Yeah. Uh, it's just it's just fun to to get to know you. And I'm, I'm always amazed how you are everywhere and you're constantly learning and getting better and stuff like that. So uh, before we wrap up, I guess uh, any advice you want to leave uh, our listeners, anyone that, that's looking to grow their lighting business? Just get engaged. You know, it's Goya. Get off your butt, man. Just get out and start playing around with lights and, you know, get involved. And, you know, it'll take you so many places rather than sit around waiting for business to come to you. Go after it. Get out and get visible. Love it, man. So, all right. Well, thank you, Roger. Appreciate your time. Thank you to Emery Allen and uh, everyone have a great week. Thanks again, Roger. Appreciate you, man. Hey, I appreciate the invite. All right, guys. Take it easy. All right.